Well, I'm an audio visual artist, so I work equally with audible and visible elements. I'm interested in voltage and vibration primarily, and what that voltage and vibration sounds like when it's mediated through a speaker system, for example. And then a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, I'm getting old, the, uh, I got really interested in the idea of what that vibration or that phenomena would look like. For a while I did just make music with computers. So my first experience with computer music was starting to program computers to, to behave in particular ways. But then I was introduced to analog synthesis, these old, very old school um, instruments that I sort of inherited by accident. I think I really like that relationship between the, the sort of warmth of the analog sound, sort of the sound of, of circuitry, then, but then combining that with the very brittle and, and digital uh, computer music that I've been working with as well. So, sort of, there's a sense of hybridity there. The Bionics Institute is a not-for-profit medical research institute. In the 80s it was involved in developing one of the first successful multi-channel cochlear implants and since then we've um, diversified into different types of medical bionic devices including the bionic eye. But one of the main focuses is still hearing research and improving cochlear implants and sound processing for cochlear implants. So this is a cochlear implant. It consists of two main parts. There's this part um, which is worn behind the ear and then there's this part which is implanted under the skin. In a normal healthy ear you have um, a structure called the cochlea which translates sound energy into electrical energy using a system of about 3,000 hair cells. For someone who has lost their hearing, they've generally, um, all of those hair cells are gone. And what happens in a cochlear implant is an array of usually 22 electrodes replaces the function of those 3,000 hair cells. So as far as musical in information goes, we've got to try and transmit complex musical sounds, um, which usually get represented by about 3,000 little bits. Um, by only 22, so it's, it's the beginning of the problem. <laughs> Before I started working with the Bionic Ear Institute, uh, I had some idea about the cochlear implant because my grandmother was kind of instrumental in setting up um, the Deafness Foundation of Victoria. So there was an odd poetic connection there. So I had heard about it, but very peripherally. And it wasn't until I met Hamish uh, who's quite an extraordinary uh, person in the sense that he's a, he's a real fan of, of experimental music, and that's quite rare. <laughs> there aren't many fans out there, but Hamish is, is truly interested in, in phenomena. I went to one of Robin's laser show gigs and I saw immediately that this was someone who would understand <laughs> um, what we were doing. He started explaining to me how, the, how the, the implant actually worked and he just started the job. And we just got talking about it and it seemed like the logical thing to do would be to try and compose music that would, that would kind of attack this piece of hardware in a way, this sort of try and break down the, the limitations of that the hardware presented by restructuring the music rather than restructuring the hardware. And that was, that was where the discussion started. The central kind of idea of the residency was that we brought in a composer, Robin Fox, and we taught him all about how cochlear implants work to a quite high level of detail. And then he started making up some software Did that, make a difference? that allowed him to compose little melodies or musical studies and run them through a cochlear implant simulator. 
I mean, this is every composer's dream is to be able to just plug into someone's brain and put electricity straight into the into the auditory nerve. But what you're doing is you're doing that at an incredibly low resolution compared to what people would normally experience as hearing. It really stripped everything away. It stripped all of the musical preconceptions out of the equation and left you with 22 electrodes that you could activate or not activate in different combinations and with different intensities. And in doing that, you could essentially invent some kind of new solfege, some kind of new scale. And then we went further and got in a bunch of volunteers who are actually use, using cochlear implants. And that was really the guts of the project, was that feedback. They played us uh, various instruments and they asked us in various parts of music and they asked us to respond to it, you know, whether if we liked it, if we didn't, how it appeared to us and so on. And of course, the problem is that no one knows how I, what I hear. So I can tell them if it was comfortable, it was pleasant, but um, whether I liked it or not, that's about it. And so we only had these two meetings and then of course there was a, the concert. At the culmination of the project, we staged two concerts at the Art Centre in Melbourne. And at the concert we had cochlear implant users, um, their friends and family and um, average music, musically interested people come along. One of the difficulties is that the music that was being composed um, was by its nature quite experimental and unfamiliar. Most people have an opinion about music, <laughs> and it's usually a very strong one. It was incredibly interesting having hundreds of people in the audience who were filling out surveys, talking about whether or not they liked the work or not. This was the most frank and honest appraisal of anything that I've done. It ranged from the wildly positive in terms of this was the best experience of my life to how do I get out of here, this is the most disastrous thing that's ever happened to me. I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it a lot. There were some things that I enjoyed more than others, and for instance, with a lot of rhythm, uh, so in some drums, or violin, or trumpet, or even electronics. Um, on the whole, it was very, very pleasant. So we were really pleased that people on the whole did enjoy the concert, because there was always this fear that it would be too experimental and too difficult for, for people to engage with. But I think in the end um, it was a success. <laughs> the Synapse residencies are, are incredible in the way that they link artists and scientists together because the, the collaborations I think are always interesting for both the scientists and the artists. In the future, we'd um, we'd love to continue working with Robin on various different projects. Um, he has an amazing ability to be able to um, speak the language of both music and science, so he's very easy to work with in that respect. We're just both interested in I don't know resonance and, and vibration and how it works across mediums, and he actually understands how it works, <laughs> which I think is. He's brilliant and I'm insanely jealous. But um, no, it's just always enlightening. But we yeah, we have a lot we have a lot to talk about and yeah, we, we worked well together I think. Mm.